the Mogcast, a fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg about the topics of the day. Welcome to the first Mogcast of this political year. It's Paul Goodman, editor of Conservative Home, once again in conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg, now leader of the House of Commons, my first Mogcast with him since that happened, here in the Cabinet Office at the heart of government. So, Jacob, let's get straight down to business. I'm not going to ask you about my proprietor's biography, Lord Ashcroft's book. We're going to save that up for the Mogcast special at Conservative Party conference, which I've thereby just advertised. We'll go straight down to business, and I want to ask you what you make of the Labour conference vote on private schools. Oh, it's just a reminder of the hard left's ambition to prevent people from having freedom of choice, that there is a great difference between the Conservative Party and the Labour Party. The Conservative Party wants individuals to run their own lives, make free choices, and to have a political system that takes obstacles out of people's path. The socialist view is that the man in Whitehall, where we are, really does know best, as Douglas Jay said all those years ago. And this is a reminder of how controlling the hard left is. It wants to lead people's life for them, and take away their ability to choose. Do you ever feel you missed anything by not going through the state system? I mean, you're commenting on the private system as someone who had experience in the private system. You were educated at Eton, after all. I was indeed, and I'm very proud to have been um, educated at Eton, which is a fantastic school, one of the best schools in the world. And it's really interesting the extent to which our private schools um, are filled with people from around the world because they are so good. And they show that excellence is something that the British can and do do in education, and our universities are world beaters as well. And it's something we should be very proud of, not least it earns revenue for the economy, but also education is a good in and of itself. But did I miss something by not going to a state school? One always misses something by not doing the thing that might, one might otherwise have done, but one can't do everything. And therefore, life evolves in a way where you see that you could have gone down a different route and life would have been different. But it's no no point in bemoaning that, I don't think. Your children are going to follow in your footsteps, by the way. Um, It's much harder to get into Eton than it was in my day. Uh, In my day, they took thick people like me. Um, I scraped into Eton. And you're kind to laugh, but you're wrong to. Um, I literally just got in uh, to Eton. I was very low down. Uh, the rankings. Um, Whereas now, I don't think I would get in. So yes, if they can get in, uh, my boys will go to Eton, and um, my daughter, Mary, uh, is down for private schools as well. Do you feel it's changed very much, by the way? It's hard to tell, because once one leaves, one becomes an outsider. But I think the fundamental of Eton is unchanging. And that is this feeling of freedom when you get there. I I very much um, understood what David Cameron was saying when he wrote in the extracts of his memoirs that I've seen. The thing about going to Eton is that suddenly you're in charge of your daily life. You are part of a town. And this seems to be enormous freedom compared to uh, prep school where every waking moment is controlled. Or if you're at a day prep school, if you cross the road, somebody's watching you to make sure you're doing it safely get to Eton, you've just got to crack on with it for yourself. It's um, a very liberating experience, and I think that has underpinned its success. You're reading the Cameron book, then? Sorry? You're reading the Cameron book. I've read the extract so far. I will definitely read his book. Uh, I think one can learn a lot from his approach to politics, and I think history will judge David Cameron very favourably. On Brexit, um, we're going to have a discussion about Labour and Brexit, which is made all the more difficult with the fact that they're debating it today, Monday, and this Mogcast is being published tomorrow, Tuesday. But do you agree, do you think that what we've seen really over the last few months, even years, is Jeremy Corbyn, who's got a long Eurosceptic pedigree, clearly is a sort of Brexiteer by some sort of instinct, slowly being driven away from the position he would like to adopt towards a more Remain stance by politicians that are openly campaigning for Remain now? Well, I think it comes to the heart of Labour Party's problem because 
uh, Jeremy Corbyn can't do what he wants to do if the country is a member of the European Union. So um, Jeremy Corbyn today said he wanted to bail out Thomas Cook. That would be illegal state aid under EU rules. Um, they wouldn't be able to abolish private schools with any ease under EU law. So um, Jeremy Corbyn, who is a red in tooth and claw socialist, recognises that he cannot do what he wants to do uh, if he finds the UK still in the European Union. And that's why he always voted against European integration, why he opposed the various treaties, and why he was always in the division lobby with Bill Cash. The, the thing to remember as a Conservative is that the democratic freedom we get by leaving the European Union would allow the country to go left as well as to go right. And I think that's quite right, because I believe in democracy, and I think the British people have a good sense never to elect a hard left government. They've never done so uh, in the past, and it looks extremely unlikely from current polls if they would. But Jeremy Corbyn must, in his heart, be as you're a skeptic as Bill Cash is, because he can't do what he wants to do without it. His party, or at least the leadership of his party, the Blairites, forget Europe, they don't like Jeremy Corbyn. So this is much about stopping Jeremy Corbyn and getting Labour back to being a Tony Blair-style Labour Party, as it is anything to do with Europe, and it completely ignores their voters in all of this, because a lot of their voters, especially outside the metropolitan areas, are voted to leave the European Union, and they're being snubbed. Of course, um, the conventional wisdom about that in the Labour Party now seems to be, I'm quoting you almost verbatim, but it's a saying that's doing the rounds, our Remain voters are more Remain than Labour, and our Leave voters are more Labour than Rem more Labour than Leave. <laughs> That's the complacency that political parties get into when they think their voters can't go anywhere else. As the Conservatives discovered in the European elections, voters can go somewhere else, and they do go somewhere else when they feel they're being betrayed. Just a moment ago, you referred to the private education issue and said he'd have great difficulty doing that in government. Um, one reason for that would be the courts. Do you think that there would be, in this imaginary world of a Jeremy Corbyn premiership, would there be a change of mood among Conservatives about the courts? Because there is a view um, in part of the Conservative family, it's pushed very extensively by policy exchange, that the courts have become too political. Uh, they're too active in the political sphere. Don't you think that would change if we had a Corbyn government? And um, the Corbyn government attempted to do all sorts of things that are outside the human rights framework. Um, in my book on the Victorians, still available from all good bookshops, um, I had a chapter on Dicey. And the reason I did so is that Dicey sets out the constitution as he saw it at the end of the 19th, early 20th century, um, and established concepts that I think are very important in a constitutional understanding. One of these is the... Um, sovereignty of Parliament, and the other is the rule of law. And I think the understanding that he had is the best understanding for the most stable and effective constitution, and allows for the best forms of government. But you have to remember within this various things. One is where does the sovereignty come from? And that is from the people. And that's why Dicey was in favour of referendums. He thought that uh, there were some issues that needed to be referred to the generators of sovereignty rather than the exercisers of that sovereignty on behalf of the generators. And he also made this very important point that convention was there ultimately to ensure that Parliament and the Cabinet did what the nation wanted. And I think that constitutional understanding is a very conservative one, and it has a right place for the various powers, that is to say, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. And this is a subject I'd be very, very happy to discuss with you at considerable length further, because I think the evolution of our constitution is interesting and important, but I'd better not say any more whilst there is a, a, a live case that touches on all these issues. What would you think in the event of a human rights-based appeal against any Labour government action to try to shut down private schools, in effect. But our human rights law is very cleverly worded and is a model I would have liked for European Union law. If the ECHR comes to a decision 
that is not automatically UK law. It has to be brought into law by Parliament. And if the courts rule that there is an incompatibility in statute law and human rights law, Parliament, by secondary legislation, has the opportunity but not the compulsion to correct it. And therefore, I think that there is still the maintenance of parliamentary sovereignty within the human rights law that we currently have. So it would be possible to imagine a kind of tussle between Parliament and the courts as we had about prisoner votes, perhaps? That's absolutely right. Um, but you yourself don't have a view you can express now on the balance between the courts and Parliament? I don't think it would be right to do so. Um, but anyone who's interested really ought to listen to Jonathan Sumption's Wreath Lectures, which are absolutely fascinating and explain so many of the constitutional implications with great clarity. And of course it is a fact, isn't it, that in, in very crude terms, Sumption was very wary of the courts acting in the way that they have sometimes and getting into the political arena. I'm not going to comment on any conclusions that uh, Lord Sumption comes to. Going to. I'm simply going to say that as a former justice of the Supreme Court um, and an incredibly thoughtful man, he has set out some things that we can all think about. You had um, no experience before being leader of the House of being on the front bench. What's the transition been like? Um, that's a very interesting question. Uh, the great advantage you have speaking from the dispatch box is that you have the last word, whereas when you're a backbencher, you make your question, you sit down and you shut up, you can't come back again. Uh, and that is rhetorically an advantageous position to be in. Do you feel in any way that, um, let's be blunt, that you messed up in the response you gave to the debate after which the 21 didn't support the government and were deprived of the whip. As one version of events is, well, Jacob got up and he gave an Oxford Union speech and he put their backs up. <laughs> I think that's ridiculous to think that people were willing to sacrifice the whip because they didn't like a few words that I'd said. Um, we were dealing with the fundamentals of the Constitution. Uh, I think it's um, an extremely unlikely uh, set of circumstances. Would you hope to have them all back, by the way? Well, the, the issue that we face on the whip is if the government were to have an election, which it wants, and were to win by 10 or 15 seats, would its Brexit policy once again be stymied? And if that were to be the case, then we would be in just as difficult a position as we are currently in. Now, I understand that one or two of those from whom the whip was taken away have made it clear that in the event of a general election, if they were to stand as Conservative candidates, they would accept that they would be obliged to follow whatever was in the manifesto. And that may be a chink of light, because as a general principle, I think it's really important that the Conservative Party is a broad church. Uh, we are not a, a narrow ideological sect. We're not Momentum. We're not Jeremy Corbyn. One or two, you think, might... No, what I'm saying is that one of two have made this indication, indication that that is their position. Now, I don't know whether that's accurate, and I don't know what the response to it would be. I just mention it because I think it's interesting uh, the way people are thinking. And, and a number of the 21 have said they're retiring anyway, mm -hmm. uh, and we're always intending to. Is what's good for the goose good for the gander in the sense that um, you know, if the Prime Minister gets a deal, puts the deal to the Commons, would it be right to remove the whip from Conservative MPs who fail to support that deal? It always depends on whether it's a matter of confidence or not. Can the government carry on? That um, uh, I voted my first set of rebellions from memory was on the Fixed Term Parliament Act. Now, this made no difference to whether or not the government could carry on. It's a particularly foolish piece of legislation as it happens, um, and one the Conservatives were committed to repealing in their last manifesto. Uh, it is perfectly reasonable to vote against the government on non-confidence matters. But if your vote is fundamental to the survival of the government, and that is expressly clear, then it is reasonable to withdraw the whip. And the question that you may want to ask 
so whether it's for me to stress the questions you may want to ask is another matter, um, is that how would I have voted had Theresa May made meaningful vote one a matter of confidence and said, if I lose, I will go to an election and anyone who votes against me will not be able to stand as a conservative. That would certainly have made me think twice. But she didn't do that. But in the last resort, um, were the government to make a vote on a, on a deal, on another withdrawal agreement, whatever, um, a vote of confidence? And it's entirely possible to think that it might, given the importance of these things. You therefore wouldn't balk if the whip were taken away from members of the ERG who voted against the government or failed to support it. I, I think the deal that Boris Johnson is likely to get will be so enormously popular with the country at large, that ERG members will be practically dancing in the streets in its support. So I think what you're proposing is unlikely. Oh, we must come back to that. If uh, oh, we will come back to that. Back as to long as I, I know, um, I am still a member of the ERG, though uh, I've retired from the um, chairmanship. Uh, just to reassure people, I won't myself be dancing, because I don't think that would be sightly. Talking of dancing, what about lying down? What do you feel about all that in retrospect? It's very funny. The, 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 the people who create memes, um, uh, have very vivid imaginations and came up with some really quite brilliant uh, little bits. Um, the, though, I, I do think in retrospect there was a mistake because, although it's very traditional, as you may know, uh, when the building was rebuilt, the chamber was rebuilt after the war, Churchill had the table and the front benches put closer together so that people could put their feet on the table, which happened until the cameras came in. But the difficulty with these things is that sitting comfortably detracts from the argument that one is putting across. And much though the memes were fun, that doesn't help anybody. Have you seen other members of the government front bench do that? They always used to. Were you leaning back to listen, by the way? Because you've no, got no, no, the, no, I'm the, not going to make any wet excuse for it. I was leaning back because it was more comfortable. <laughs> There's no other reason. No other reason than, than that? No ulterior motive, no, no. Um, and... Finally, I mean, we're getting towards the sort of final questions. Where do you think we are on the deal, the negotiation, the EU, whatever may happen when, when you come back, assuming the court doesn't summon you all back? But again, um, David Cameron's memoirs, or the extracts from it, because unlike you, I haven't yet read it in full, are fascinating on how he negotiated with the European Union and how difficult um, some of our closest allies uh, are in these discussions, and therefore how difficult it is to know precisely where you're going, because there seems to be an element of saying one thing and doing another, according at least to his memoirs. He has more experience of this than I do. Um, on the other hand, the EU can do one thing, and that is act very quickly when it really needs to. If you recall, the bailout for the euro of 600 billion euros was arranged over a weekend uh, whilst the markets were closed, it had to be done before the New Zealand foreign exchange market reopened. Um, in fact, it ignored all the EU's laws and treaties. Nonetheless, it stumped up 600 billion euros to do it. When it needs to act quickly, it can do so very quickly. When it doesn't need to act quickly, it models itself on the sluggard. It's the voice of the sluggard I heard him complain, you've waked me too soon, I must slumber again, as the door on its hinges, so he on his bed turns his hide in his shoulders and his heavy head. Um, and I think we may get some swift action as we get closer to the 31st of October. On a decidedly non-sluggardly note, do you share the Prime Minister's optimism that there'll be a deal? I mean, he's very optimistic and usually is. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there is a high chance of a deal. Jacob, thank you very much. It's a pleasure uh, we will as sit always. down again in front of a live audience at Conservative Party Conference for our Mogcar special and look forward to seeing you then. Well, I'm much looking forward to it. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to appear in front of some of the best people in the country at the Conservative Party Conference. I'm very grateful. The Mogcast, a fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg about the topics of the day.